Welcome to another Debaco University video. Here we're going to be looking at cannabis classification. In these three terms we might be familiar with, sativa, indica, and rudalis. We're going to define them and look at them in a little bit more detail here. So first off, cannabis uh, is a genus, and it's likely to have originated in the wet habits of the Asia continent. It's been a long coexistence with mankind, which led to its early domestication. The reason why it was domesticated is because of its many uses and possibilities. It could be the source for textile fibers. Um, it can also be utilized for its psychoactive compounds. And this early domestication has led to many specializations of the plant that fall into two main categories. One is fiber, and the other would be chemical compounds. And breeding continues for increasing diversity and specificity within these general classes classifications. Now cannabis is dioecious, so what does that mean? It means it produces distinctive male and distinctive female plants. Each plant from the point that is an embryo is genetically either male or female, and it's visually identifiable by the flowers that it will produce. In some isolated cases, uh, plants will produce both male and female flowers. These are called hermaphrodites, or hermes. Uh, with chemical treatments, it is possible for a female plant to produce pollen, and also a male plant to actually produce uh, female um, flowers, but for the most part, just talking about no general uh, alterations, it is a distinctive male plant or a distinctive female plant. Other uh, plants may produce monoecious plants where they produce male and female flowers on the same plant. Cannabis is not like that, it's distinctive male or female plants. Now, vernacular, those sativas, those indicas, those realis that we might be familiar with. These are commonly used, but however, the use of them is actually against the recommendations by 20th century botanists. Instead, personal and cultural biases prevailed, and so did the use of these terms. This is why they're so entrenched in the cannabis culture even today. Four main classifications of cannabis, just in general. Uh, remember that classification is really based more on the morphology, not the physiology. And remember, morphology is a study of size, shape, and structure, how it physically looks, maybe the phenotype, you could think about it that way, where physiology is relating to the function of the organism and how they respond to challenges. So you kind of get like a muscle would be the morphology, whether it's skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle. The physiology is how that muscle actually contracts to kind of give you that comparison between the terms morphology and physiology. To predict potential effects, the cannabinoids and terpenes, which are the chemical profiles, should be identified. You shouldn't be looking at just how the plant looks. You should be more concerned with the chemical profiles. Each plant morphology grouping has its own general advantages, but also has a set of drawbacks. So looking first at sativas. Sativas in general grow really tall, 4 to 15 feet. Their internode spacing is about 3 to 6 inches. Their leaves are long and thin. The advantage is that they produce high biomasses. They're commonly grown outdoors and produce better in climates with a long, warmer growing season to allow that plant to get to its full size. The drawbacks are when grown outdoors, it can be more susceptible to wind damage because it can get so tall and can have increased time to flower and mature compared to other options. This is also a photoperiod dependent uh, strain here. Now the indicas, these tend to be smaller plants, only about one to six feet tall. Their internode spacing is three inches or less. And they have a wide leaf morpholo morphology. This advantage is it can be fit for indoor growing operations that have limited ceiling height. They have a shorter flowering time, so it can allow for more plant cycles for an indoor grow, and can often have quicker flowering time than what I just talked about there with sativas. Performs well in colder climates with shorter growing seasons. However, the drawbacks are the total biomass produced may be a little bit under or reduced uh, overall, and this is another photoperiod dependent uh, strain here. Now, Rudalis are the autoflowers, where things get a little bit more interesting, shall we say. They tend to be very small plants, only one to three foot range, tight internode spacing, and frequent branching with small, wide leaves. The advantage is, is they're photoperiod independent, meaning they will flower based on a set number of days. They're not dependent on the duration of sunlight that they're exposed to or light that they're exposed to. However, currently there's some limited options in this category, uh, but where those options do exist, it can be uh, quite advantageous. However, the drawbacks are they tend to be smaller plants, which can mean less yield, and typically produce less cannabinoids and terpenes than other options. A day lost with these plants is a greater portion of the total life cycle because you can't make that up. Where the photoperiod dependent ones, if you're growing indoors in particular, you can change when you're going to flip them to flower. These are predetermined based on days old. 
And we also have hybrids, and many current plants are actually hybrids due to the um, secretive and often unknown breeding that has occurred. Uh, and these general characters of these hybrids are variable because it depends on what plants were used for breeding and what percentage. It might be a sativa indica, a 50-50 split, or does it favor one versus the other? And again, if it's a sativa indica hybrid or true uh, sativa indica hybrid, it'll be photoperiod dependent. Advantages are the best of both worlds. You get the autoflowering plant behavior potentially with still producing desired cannabinoids and terpenes with some hybrids. This can expand the cannabinoid and terpene profiles produced. If you're breeding two distinctly different lines together, you could get the best of both worlds. The drawback is you could also get the worst of the both combinations that you're breeding together. So there is some time to breed these and some kind of refinement that needs to occur as well. Now, in general, the summary, kind of indica versus sativa, kind of have some examples here, have a little resource here that you can kind of go through and look if you're interested. Looking at just the general morphology, and some more apt to be kind of the cannabinoid production, some more for fiber production, some more for seed production. Um, so again, these can have different derivatives based on kind of what they're known to be producing or what they produce in greater quantities. You can take a look at that there. And we have, you know, the indicas, the afghans, uh, some of those relate to where that plant may originate from, where that land race, land race may originate as well. And this is the last the characteristic here of some cannabis strains, looking at the phenotypes, and then we're looking uh, also at the origins and aroma descriptions here, just to give you some idea of some of the diversity that does occur within cannabis. You might look at all these quickly and say, oh, they look very similar, but as you start looking at them in more detail, you see different phenotypes, different morphologies develop. And in different, different morphologies, they also have those different aromas, descriptions, cannabinoids, and terpene profiles. So keep that in mind that cannabis is a very broad category. We want to be looking at some of the specifics so we can ensure that we're growing the quote best variety or strain to fit our particular conditions or desired end products.